Well, good afternoon. We're going to talk about the car sort of as a living room on wheels. Maybe people will be spending more time in their autonomous cars than they did in their non-autonomous cars. A number of automakers have recently shown interiors of what cars might look like if we don't have to sit facing the uh, road. Are we going to sit facing each other? And uh, maybe, Philip, we can start with that. Uh, Volkswagen Group has recently showed something called the Cedric, which is a version of an autonomous car showing the interior. Um, what, what does VW see as the, the whole future of the yeah. autonomous interior? Maybe we can just start with that. Okay. Jim, Jim thank you very much. Um, yes, the vision that Volkswagen Group has um, is the following, that we need to give, and we have, we have the opportunity to give people back time. And uh, also, create more equity in transportation. Um, today, if, you're, if, you, if you come from Lisbon, you're lucky. You spend wasting 24 hours a year in traffic. If you live in LA, it's over 100 hours. The average American spends about 290 hours driving in a year. That's the equivalent of seven working weeks spent behind the driving wheel. So if you can create a space in a vehicle that allows you to, to work, to learn, uh, maybe even get uh, medical treatment um, in your car and provide access also to um, uh, minorities, uh, handicapped, blind, etc. This is something that we can offer in autonomous vehicles and Volkswagen Group has um, created a, um, a model, a version of a car, self-driving car called Cedric, which uh, achieves exactly that and provides those facilities and features. Of course, it raises the possibility of a lot more people being empowered to drive, therefore more cars on the road, which is not necessarily the ideal solution. Uh, Shaq, let me turn to you. You're, you're pioneering a sort of uh, digital chassis that will essentially be what people will use when they're in this mode of uh, not driving themselves. It'll be almost more like a train. And you've also addressed what I think is one of the biggest bugaboos when we talk about this idea of people facing each other in the car, which is that you get car sick when you do that. And your digital chassis replacing the shock absorbers has the potential to do that. I saw it in Boston about a week ago, and I was blown away at the possibility of it. So just tell me a little bit about what your clear motion technology does. Yeah, sure. So um, just by way of introduction, uh, I'm the CEO of Clear Motion. Uh, we're a company f uh, on a mission to transform the quality of time in cars. So as Philip says, and Jim, uh, Jim's going to talk on too, is the quality of time in cars has to transform. Uh, we're, uh, in the U.S., we're on the road 48 minutes a day. Hopefully that computes to 290 <laughs> hours a year, which I think it, it, it does. But um, yeah, to read and to work and to sleep, we need to deliver a ride quality starting from the foundation of the car. Our relationship to the road needs to change. Software needs to control that relationship to the road. And I think uh, the team back there, uh, AV, has a, a short video to, to walk you through. So you're not going to believe this when you see it going down the road. Yeah, so Jim, I, we had a chance to host you and, and to show you. So as you can see, this is a, a fully active car that we've built the passive on the left and then the active on the right. And you can see what it does is essentially it does for motion what noise canceling does for noise. It reads the road surface, it actually fingerprints road surfaces and it keeps the body of the car completely flat as the wheels are looking to erase everything underneath the car. And so this effectively creates a, a bullet train like ride quality so that you can do productive things and take that 48 minutes back and make that productive. Mm -hmm. One of the Very things cool. you mentioned to me was point. that you would be able to turn this off if you were, say, driving the car yourself, because you'd want more of the driving experience. <coughs> Jim, let's turn to you. Uh, you're with Toyota uh, Ventures, and you've funded, I think you said, five things, one of them being Nato, which was on my panel yesterday. So talk about what have you funded, and uh, what's it new and exciting? As you mentioned to me, some of the things that people don't think of, like the need for power in the autonomous car, like if the autonomous car is going to be electric, and the autonomy part of it demands a lot of power, we're in trouble because the range is going to uh, shrink. So you're actually funding something that addresses that. That's right. Uh, so thank, thanks, Jim. Uh, so Toyota AI Ventures is a subsidiary of Toyota Research, which is focusing on uh, self-driving cars, both driver-assisted for safety, completely autonomous for accessibility, robotics, and what's next for Toyota, which is the genesis of Toyota AI Ventures. 
uh, which is focusing on early stage. It's a hundred million dollar fund focusing on uh, artificial intelligence, data, and cloud applied to what we call autonomous mobility and robotics. And one of the companies we funded that I was talking to Jim about backstage is a company called Slamcore. And they're a computer vision company, and you've all heard a lot about computer vision companies, but what they're doing is, is a really focused, low power uh, solution. Because when you open up an autonomous vehicle, there's about two kilowatts of power in the trunk. And that is untenable when you have an uh, electric vehicle, which we've heard a lot about at the show. If you start to lose significant range, we all have range anxiety, we don't need more range anxiety when we have a, uh, an autonomous vehicle. And what's fascinating is that the human brain by you know, some uh, neuromorphic uh, uh, studies takes up about, uses about 50 watts of power. Uh, and so we're driving on 50 watts of power, uh, I had two teenage sons, and I, I'm sure they drive on like five watts of power uh, because they're just distracted all the time. Uh, so there's tremendous opportunity to uh, lower the power footprint in the car and therefore create uh, 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 energy capacity for other kinds of services uh, like what Shaq and Philip were talking about. I wanted to bring up something that I don't think is getting enough attention right now, and it's whether the shared whether the autonomous car will be shared or owned. And I think this is critical to how the uh, autonomous car is going to evolve. If it's not shared, we're just going to have more cars on the road and essentially business as usual. We've all seen the traffic here in Lisbon can get pretty terrible at rush hour. Uh, a, a whole lot of autonomous cars out there that are privately owned would have the same basic situation, though you might be able to do your, some work on the way home. It's, it's only an incremental improvement. And uh, I've, I've heard Robin Chase of uh, Zipcar talk about the importance of being able to make these cars shared, because then we can actually reduce the number of vehicles on the road and get them used, because right now cars are used 5% of the time and they sit 95% of the time. Is the autonomous car going to be shared? Because we're also talking about a lot of sharing technology and uh, how that's evolving. Is that how it's going to evolve, or might there be a the business as usual, any of you. Well, I, I, can, start and I can start off. Uh, I think that you're, you will see autonomous uh, technologies first uh, present themselves in what we call mobility as a service. Uh, so autonomy will be here uh, sooner than you think, but not everywhere you would like. Uh, so your ride hailing uh, uh, trip will show up without a driver if the roads are good and there's no construction and the weather's good, uh, then there'll be no driver. And so what's nice about that is the, uh, the cars can be used more of the time uh, and therefore they can afford uh, a greater sensor, more expensive sensor package. And it's a gentle slope when the roads aren't good. If there's construction or the weather's bad, uh, the car will show up with a driver. That's very different than a personally owned vehicle that has to be uh, autonomous all the time in all weather conditions and all road conditions. So I think that mobility as a service will actually be the place where, you s where we all see autonomy first. I, I hope it goes. Did anyone else want to address that? I hope it goes in that direction. Well, uh, I share the views that um, Jim has just expressed. Uh, that, that will be the introduction of autonomy uh, on the roads. That's how we will learn and experience autonomy. Um, so there's a long way still to go for personal ownership, personally owned autonomous vehicles, uh, they will eventually also be available, but we also need to deal with the consequences that you mentioned, Jim, in terms of empty vehicles constantly <laughs> clogging up the road to pick up various parts of the family. You know, it's interesting that when you think about it, the idea of automakers becoming essentially partners in mobility as opposed to just selling you a car, it's a big change in the uh, auto company um, modus operandi we've had for more than a hundred years. And I have to give the companies credit for actually starting to look at this and seeing how mobility as a service will become a new business that could be bigger than the business of selling cars. So I find that a real interesting development and the auto companies are by offering car to go and all these other different services. Um, another thing that's obviously going to happen with electric cars is our, our, it's going to happen with autonomous cars that they'll be electric. And certainly the Volkswagen group is in the pathway of bringing out a whole lot of electric cars. 
Uh, the Mission E from Porsche is about to be debuted, and it's a competitor to the Tesla Model S. Do you, do you see the future of the Volkswagen Group being electric cars, just quickly? Yep. Um, electrification is a very important element in the future of mobility, um, because especially in shared mobility, because electric vehicles are need less maintenance, um, they have better uptime, and uh, they're essentially, therefore, cheaper to operate. It's all about, and we had this on, on your panel, I think, Jim, um, we, uh, you talked about it uh, before, that um, that's all about um, total cost of ownership and keeping the costs down, and electric vehicles provide that opportunity. So electrification is a very important and essential element in, uh, in the future of mobility, and especially for autonomous vehicles. Shaq, I wanted to ask you, you partnered with Bridgestone, the big tire giant that also includes Firestone, and uh, they're also an investor of yours, and they're gonna presumably be marketing your technology. I think you told me in a couple of years we're gonna see this in cars. Yeah, that's right. So, very exciting announcement. I mean, the, the, the product is going into a production car now and will be sold in, in a couple of years to consumers. Okay. And Jim, I wanted to ask you, uh, Toyota's approach has been an interesting one in the sense that you're not so much concentrating on self-driving cars as using technology to make cars safer. That's been sort of the emphasis of Toyota's research arm. And I think that has had benefits for the road cars that Toyota's put out. But what's the long-term vision there? Does it ultimately result in autonomous vehicles, or where does it, where does it going? Well, I think that uh, at Toyota Research Institute, we're doing uh, what we call Guardian, which is making cars safer, uh, and uh, Chauffeur, which is completely driverless, L4, level four, SAE level four. And so we're building a set of technologies that support both of those. Uh, at Toyota, we believe that uh, cars are fun, and driving is fun. And so, uh, but yet, cars are also a utility that gets you from, uh, gets you to school and gets you to work. So uh, there's no other appliance in our life that we are so connected to. Uh, the, the, the automobile has its own room in your home, the garage. And, and so there's incredible passion for this vehicle that seems to extend your agency in the world and empowers you in a, in a very emotional way. And we don't think that's going away anytime soon, but the utility will continue to get more efficient uh, and more autonomous, and we will let the market decide in where, what areas of the world w where uh, drivers still want to drive, and we want to make them uh, th that experience as safe as possible. Uh, there's been uh, there will be other areas in the world where uh, mobility as a service will dominate. We of course will make those uh, experiences as safe as possible. Uh, but we we think these underlying technologies are really quite common between both. When you think about an, an artificially intelligent driver, there's not a whole lot of difference between a, a naturally intelligent driver. Uh, they support each other, and and so we take a much more holistic view. Uh, and uh, to, to a technologically general view of how uh, uh, artificial intelligence technologies will move into automotive. Let's get back to this concept of the living room on wheels, which I find fascinating, because essentially tomorrow's car is a, brank, a blank slate. We've essentially been tied to this image of you know, the steering wheel, the dashboard, the instruments, the seats facing forward. Now all that is sort of thrown into the hopper, and we can do whatever we want. The windows don't even have to uh, be clear anymore. We can turn them into screens. Mm -hmm. So just looking at that, looking at how the car might change inside, how the interior might change, what are some ideas you think we're going to see on cars in the near future? Shaq, why don't you take Yeah, that? so I wanted to double click on Jim's point, right? Cars, the foundation of the luxury car business is driving pleasure. It's, it's, it's the thrill of driving. And so this world in which the steering wheel is going to remain in the car, Okay, and the car will increasingly become uh, hands-free when you want it to be. The driver now becomes a passenger, and then the passenger sitting in the driver's seat hits a button, and then is the driver again. And so, when you think about driving cars that are designed as a driving machine, and then cars that are designed as a riding machine, right? They're cars that are designed to be chauffeured, right? Which, for all intents and purposes, are autonomous, and that you're sitting in the back and you're not engaged with the road. So. 
part of the, the thesis of clear motion is about, okay, how do you take the cockpit, which is a driving machine, and the cabin, which is the autonomous view, how do you bring both of these worlds into one? Because the steering wheel isn't gonna go away anytime soon, okay, it'll still be out there. And so this creates a dilemma for the OEM in which, okay, are we selling to a driver or are we selling to the passenger? Because now the driver becomes the passenger. And so how could we create a clear motion, the dynamics in which you get the, you get you know, the thrill of driving and then you flip a button and then you're in a bullet train. And so that's what proactive ride technology can do. Yeah, Jim, you want well, to? Well, and the, the beauty of this is that no one knows the right answer, right? What Shaq is doing is he's, he's doing an incredible amount of innovation and running a market experiment that when he's successful, he will, it, it will be you know, wildly transformative to the market. And we want to, every startup is a, uh, an experiment in the market because we don't know how it's all going to play out. And so what's been amazing about uh, the disruption that has come for automotive is that uh, it's, in, it's time to run some experiments. And it used to be auto, the automotive industry moved very slowly and could evolve slowly. Now it's under an intense disruptive fit. And the <laughs> startups are driving that. And that's one of the reasons why we did Toyota AI Ventures to connect to this disruption. Because if you look at the big disruptors, Kodak, for example, Kodak inve invented digital photography in the 70s. And then later, Google, Facebook, and Apple went on to create a trillion dollars of market cap from Kodak's invention. And Kodak is an also ran. So Toyota, and if, if Toyota is going to dominate the next era, we must connect to that innovation, to companies like Shaq's and others. I was going to ask Philip a question related to that, which is at the, the big auto companies in many ways have been vertically integrated. They pretty much did it all. There wasn't a lot of, there were suppliers, but a lot of the innovation came from within side. But now, as, as Jim points out, there's a lot of innovation happening in startups. So uh, could you talk about VW being engaged with those startups also? Yeah, um, absolutely. I'm, I'd just like to, to, to add to the previous conversation uh, in terms of design capabilities uh, that you have with autonomous vehicles going forward. You have new freedoms you could never imagine before because autonomous vehicles by definition are also going to be safer vehicles and so you don't need to provide the sort of um, buffer zones in the front or rear of a vehicle and you, you can create vehicles with a very small footprint on the road with a lot of space and a lot of um, also usability inside the vehicles you know, thanks to technologies from Shaq and uh, other humanized driving um, uh, technologies that allow you to get a very, very comfortable smooth ride with any heavy no, accidental braking. We only have a minute yeah. left. So, so, in terms of innovation, uh, your other point, um, this is very important for the car industry. There's a lot of innovation out there, and we welcome that. We support that. We also at Porsche SE, we're also investing in uh, young technology companies to support the ecosystem and bring those technologies to life because we need those in the, our big um, car organizations and want to cooperate more closely with such young All companies. right, we have like half a minute. So I want to ask you just quickly, lightning round thing here. Uh, what is the date on which we'll be at level five autonomy cars mm -hmm. on the road? Shaq, give me a date. Mm -hmm. not, not a range, just a, a year. 2020. 2020. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> give, me a, give me a date. <laughs> 20, Can't come soon enough. Yeah, uh, 2050. 2050. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Look level five. Oh, level, level five. five. Level, five. Level, four. level five well, means okay. all the time, everywhere. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. Every situation. Okay, okay. It's going to be a long time, my friends. Okay, okay. Philip, just give it's me a date. It's going to be between the don't, two. Of don't them. qualify <laughs> it. Just give me a date. No, it's uh, it's going to be between the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Philip, right. Jim, and Shaq. That was thank great. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. <clears throat>